Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can okay it unless it goes through London. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish and um, what's happening today. Hello and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. It is now and forever will be known as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe. 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was balanced on. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic, down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European. And that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. Look at the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. Thank you, colleagues. Point of order from Mike Rumbles. Presiding officer, I seek your guidance on our procedures. As you all know, the First Minister announced that at midnight last night, she was imposing restrictions on people who reside in the local government areas of East Renfrewshire, Glasgow, and Western Bartonshire. She said that, and I quote, you should not host people from other households in your home, and you should not visit someone else's home, no matter where it is. Now, as far as I understand it, as far as I understand it, no regulations to do this have been lodged with Parliament about imposing these restrictions on the population. Again, as I understand it, these restrictions are not restrictions at all, but purely advice to those in the local authorities, these local authority areas. That's how I understand it. However, there is a great deal of confusion today because the media are reporting that these restrictions have indeed been imposed. I seek your guidance on the procedures as to whether the government have now laid these regulations to impose these restrictions before Parliament, because I want to know that the proper procedures have been followed according to, could I, according to the... Uh, would you stop barracking, please? Can we have some order, please, and let's hear the point of order? Thank you. I want to know that the proper procedures have been followed according to the legislation passed unanimously in this Parliament in March, giving the Scottish Government these unprecedented powers. I want to be sure, as an individual MSP, that these powers are being exercised in accordance with our procedures. I'm barracked to say I know the answer. I genuinely do not know the answers because of the confusion that has been caused... Today. Are these powers imposed on the population through regulation? And if it is, that's quite proper and correct. Or are these powers not being imposed on the population? And people should be told that, presiding officer. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, would you mind if I responded to this? And then, because I, I believe the First Minister, you will, well, First Minister. 
When I uh, announced the revised guidance uh, for people in Glasgow uh, and Western Bartonshire and East Renfrewshire last night, um, I specifically said that at this stage, this is in the form of guidance, but as we have done in other situations, if we consider it necessary, we will translate that into regulation. If we decide to do that, then of course, the proper procedures of this parliament will be followed. Uh, what we are seeking to do right now is make sure uh, that the public are uh, under uh, no uh, doubt about what we are asking and advising them to do. Uh, and I'll come on to that later on. But I would have thought all of us in this parliament, if we are interested in suppressing this infectious virus, actually have a duty not to sow confusion, but to give clear advice to people across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Just to return to the point of order, can I first of all thank Mr Rumbles for giving me advance notice of the point of order, and this is the first available opportunity to, to raise such an issue. Uh, I am aware of Mr Rumbles' ongoing interest in this matter. Uh, in this case, I would first of all observe that the term restrictions is used uh, to cover uh, guidance, statutory guidance and regulations, and all of those questions uh, are matters for the government. And I would advise Mr Rumbles to put any direct questions on that matter to the government directly. What I would observe from a parliamentary perspective is that clearly if uh, such restrictions uh, are a matter of regulations, those will have to be laid before Parliament and Parliament will have an opportunity uh, to uh, pass its view on, on the regulations. Uh, so thank you for that and thank you for the First Minister for the clarification. Uh, actually, I would just take the opportunity to observe that um, what's also important from a parliamentary perspective is that important announcements are made to Parliament. In this case, the government did inform me directly before five o'clock yesterday, notifying me that it would be very difficult to do so because of the timing, and the government offered minister, uh, members from the affected region uh, a chance to discuss the restrictions last night at five o'clock, which I think was very helpful. So on that note, we're going to move on to First Minister's questions. And the First Minister, I believe, is going to begin with a short statement updating us on the current COVID situation. First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I will give a very brief update. Uh, an additional 156 cases of COVID were confirmed yesterday. That's 1% of people newly tested yesterday. And the total number now is 20,788. Uh, 86 of these new cases are in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 26 in Lanarkshire, 16 in Lothian, and six in Ayrshire and Arran. The remaining 22 are distributed across six other health board areas. 258 patients are in hospital, six fewer than yesterday, and five people are in intensive care, uh, one fewer than yesterday. I'm sorry to say that in the past 24 hours, one death was registered of a patient who had tested positive, and the number of deaths under that measurement is now 2,495. In addition, National Records of Scotland has just published its weekly update, which includes deaths of people confirmed through a test and also cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death. The latest update, update covers the week to Sunday, 30th of August, and shows that the total number of registered deaths with either a confirmed or presumed link to COVID is now 4,228. Six of those were registered in the previous week, which is the same number as the week before. Two were in care homes, which is two fewer than the previous week. And once again, my condolences go to everyone who has lost a loved one. Um, in the interest of public information um, and indeed parliamentary information, presiding officer, let me just briefly mention two other matters. Uh, last night, we announced that Greece has been added to the list of countries subject to quarantine restrictions. Test and Protect has found in recent days, a number of new COVID cases can be connected to individuals returning from that country. The new restrictions apply from 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. Anyone arriving in Scotland from Greece after that time must self-isolate for 14 days. Anyone who has returned from Greece in the past few days should be particularly careful about social interactions and follow all of the facts advised particularly carefully. Um, given the uncertainties inherent in a global pandemic, I also want to repeat my advice for people to be very cautious about non-essential foreign travel. Uh, right now, there can be no guarantee that the rules on quarantine won't change while you're away and affect you on your return. Um, secondly, let me just briefly remind people living in Glasgow City, East Renfrewshire and Western Bartonshire uh, of the new guidance in place. Uh, the level of COVID is particularly high and rising in these areas. And given the toll we know COVID can take, doing nothing was not an option. Uh, the data we now get from Test and Protect allows us uh, to be uh, much more targeted in the measures we take. And what we know is that unlike the pub-based cluster in Aberdeen a few weeks ago, data so far suggests that transmission in the west of Scotland is happening, not exclusively, 
but mainly in people's homes. Uh, so the uh, guidance is now, uh, firstly, if you live in Glasgow, East Renfrewshire and Western Bartonshire, you should not host people from other households in your home and you should not visit someone else's home, no matter where that is. Uh, there are exceptions for emergencies, providing care or shopping to vulnerable people and for uh, extended households. And you can find further guidance and a Q&A at www.gov.scot. Uh, second, if any member of your household is identified as a close contact of someone who has tested positive, we will now ask the whole household to isolate for 14 days and local authorities are stepping up their support arrangements. Uh, and lastly, visits to care homes in these three areas is now restricted to outdoor only and hospital visiting will return to essential visits only. Uh, these restrictions will be in place uh, for two weeks and reviewed in one week. Uh, they've not been put in place lightly, but they are necessary and we believe proportionate and we hope they will allow spread to be contained at an early stage without the need for further measures later. Uh, they apply only in these three council areas uh, right now, but I think they should be a wake-up call for all of us. If we let it, this virus will spread rapidly. The good news, though, is if we all stick to some basic rules and continue to make some sacrifices, we can stop it. Uh, but bluntly, that only works if we all do these things. So please make sure you are aware of what the rules are and stick to them and follow the facts rules. Face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean hands and hard surfaces, keep two metres distancing and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. All of this is more important now than it has been at any stage of this pandemic so far. Thank you. I would just remind members that we're sticking to the format where uh, all supplementaries to uh, the First Minister will be asked at the end of all the questions. That is today after question seven. First question from Ruth Davison. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the First Minister announced plans for a referendum bill. Why is that more urgent than an education bill? First Minister. Uh, this government has uh, a very well-known, uh, well-established and well-underway programme of improvements and reform in education. Uh, of course, we have uh, taken additional steps to make sure uh, that pupils catch up the education that they've lost over uh, the COVID period. Uh, we've given additional funding to local authorities uh, for that. And of course, we are providing uh, additional uh, funding specifically to recruit additional teachers. Uh, education uh, and improving education remains uh, the priority for this government. Uh, but on a uh, basic uh, matter of democracy, I believe it is for the people of Scotland uh, to choose their own future. I'll argue that case in a democratic election. Um, people will have the ability to decide in the way that they vote. Uh, and if they endorse uh, my view that there should be a referendum on independence, people then will have the right to choose Scotland's future. Fundamentally, presiding officer, I believe in democracy. I think we now know that Ruth Davidson doesn't. Ruth Davidson. But doesn't believe in it when she doesn't like the answer. Um, <laughs> Presiding officer, this year Scottish school pupils missed an entire term of classroom teaching. We know that loss of time will have fallen hardest on pupils from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, the very pupils whose communities have been left devastated by the pandemic. And we know that thousands of Scottish pupils will need to self-isolate over the coming months, losing further crucial classroom time. In the face of the pandemic, this government had no choice but to close Scotland's schools. But it does have a choice to help mitigate the effects of that classroom shutdown on those who suffered most from it. The Scottish Conservatives have already called for extra tuition for the most disadvantaged. So can the First Minister guarantee that the additional money that she's confirmed will go directly to the schools and head teachers who need it most? First Minister. The money is precisely to allow local authorities and teachers uh, and schools to decide uh, the different ways in which uh, they think it is appropriate to help students catch up. There is uh, money uh, specifically uh, there to recruit extra teachers to help with that catch up and to improve the resilience as we continue to go through uh, this COVID uh, pandemic. Of course, the attainment fund uh, puts money directly with head teachers. We've confirmed the attainment funding uh, for uh, the next period uh, for schools and we have uh, invested hundreds of millions of pounds in the tackling attainment fund that goes uh, directly to teachers uh, over the past few years. So we will continue to make sure the investment is there and we will continue to support teachers, schools, young people and parents uh, not just to catch up uh, the education that has been unfortunately lost during the COVID pandemic, but to make sure uh, that that effort and that objective of closing the attainment cap, uh, gap continues to be the priority. 
Ms Davison. Thank you. It was revealed this week that the Scottish Qualifications Authority has planned for schools to cover less ground in the curriculum in key subjects, including English and maths. Instead of building our pupils back up, this government seems content to accept second best. Less teaching, less learning, less knowledge this year for young people who already lost out last year. I don't think that's acceptable, and I doubt that many parents across Scotland will either. Parents expect this government to have the ambition to deliver the same standards of teaching as in any normal school year and nothing less. So will the First Minister ask the SQA to think again? First Minister. Well, the SQA will do the work that is required. Of course, we have established uh, the independent review to make sure we learn all of the lessons of uh, the exams or the, uh, what was put in place because we didn't have exams this year. And I think it's right that we allow that work to happen. The SQA, SQA will look closely um, at issues around the curriculum and will listen very carefully to uh, the views that have been expressed in that. Uh, these are debates that are uh, ongoing across the whole of the UK right now and it's important I think particularly given the mistakes that were made uh, and I take responsibility for those mistakes around the SQA results this year that we take time to make sure that we get that right while continuing to support young people through an ongoing virus situation that has not yet uh, ended. So we will continue to take these decisions uh, very carefully. Of course, coming back to the, the core challenge all of us face right now, uh, we have uh, seen Scottish young people thankfully return to schools because of our different term uh, dates earlier than uh, most uh, other young people across the UK. But an objective right now is to make sure they can stay at school full time and that there is no further disruption to young people's education, which is why uh, all of the advice that we are giving and all of the difficult decisions we are taking to suppress the virus remains so important. And we've got to keep absolutely focused on all of that. Ruth Davison. The SQA will do what is required. It is acceptable to you when you know that they're planning to cover less ground this year to tell our parents, to tell our children that they'll be taught less and they will learn less. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure that's good enough. Now, I know that the First Minister doesn't like to be asked questioned on her record, but the fact is she deserves to be challenged on this because it was her that said that education would be her number one priority. It wasn't us. It was her who said that a flagship education bill was needed to fix Scottish education, not us. It was her that said closing the attainment gap was what she wanted judged by, and her record simply doesn't stand the test. First Minister, there are warnings ringing out about this school year already. There are parents, there are pupils, there are teachers who have all sounded an alarm about the SQA's plans. Shouldn't that be her focus? First Minister. Uh, all of these things are my daily focus. Can I say to Ruth Davidson, not only am I uh, perfectly willing and happy uh, to have questions asked of me about my record, my policies and my plans, I'm happy to allow the Scottish people to judge that in an election. Instead, we have, we have Ruth Davidson, who wants to continue to be a politician, but without the consent of a single person across this country. And yet she has, she's heading to an unelected parliament, but has the brass neck to lecture the rest of us on scrutiny and accountability. There is no ermine cloak in the world will cover up that hypocrisy. On the issue of education, we decided not to take the time to pass legislation, but to get on and do all of the things that would have been in that bill eh, without the need for legislation. We are investing record sums in closing the attainment gap. We are supporting young people through this difficult period and we will work with the SQA. Unlike other governments, we won't uh, blame a body like the SQA. We will take responsibility and we will work with them to make sure that young people are supported to catch up their education, but this crucial work to close the attainment gap and raise standards for all continues. And we will be accountable that, uh, for that before the Scottish people in just a few months' time. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind members of my uh, register of interest, especially my trade union membership? Presiding Officer, we now know that in the early days of the pandemic, not only were untested patients discharged into care homes, patients who had tested positive for COVID-19 were sent into care homes. The Scottish Government can continue to wait for the data from Public Health Scotland, but these are 
undisputed facts, even if they had to be uncovered by freedom of information requests and journalistic digging. The review announced yesterday into the future of social care is welcome, and a national care service is something Scottish Labour has called for for a decade. But I say to the First Minister, we cannot go forward without looking back at what went wrong in care homes during this pandemic. This morning, I spoke with Alan Whiteman. Alan is part of the Bereaved Families for Justice group. He told me that his mother was in a care home in Fife. He has no complaints about the care she got in the home, but sadly she died from COVID-19 on the 6th of May this year. She had just turned 80. Alan is angry. He says that the government, in his words, seeded the virus into care homes without considering the consequences. He told me that he does not want compensation. He just wants to prevent other families from having to suffer. So he told me that as well as a human rights-based full public inquiry, we need an urgent review, and in his words, we need it fast. So for Alan's sake, and for all those other grieving families, will you instigate an urgent, independent review of what happened? Because Scotland's bereaved families deserve answers, they deserve justice, and they shouldn't have to wait. First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, my uh, condolences are with uh, everyone who is in Alan's uh, position and uh, specifically to him for the loss uh, he and his family have suffered. I, I deeply regret, and I know everybody does every single uh, loss of life in this pandemic overall, and particularly because of the vulnerability of the people involved, uh, those who lost their lives in care homes. Um, I have a job to do right now, which is to continue to take the decisions with my colleagues to steer the country as safely as possible through the remainder of this pandemic. None of us know how long that will take. And I have a duty to the country to make sure that our undivided focus is on that. And, and that's what I intend to do. Uh, we learn lessons as, as we go along in that, and uh, we take uh, a whole range of advice about the steps that we require to put in place. That is why on a range of things, uh, from the, the guidance that is in place through to testing, care home visiting, uh, we have uh, changed our position uh, as we learn more about the virus and the experience people have had, and we will continue uh, to do that. And you know, while I am not complacent and every single death is one too many, we have seen over uh, a number of weeks the situation in care homes uh, improve in terms of uh, a reduction in cases and thankfully a, a vast reduction in the number of older people uh, losing their lives, which uh, says that there is uh, an effectiveness of the arrangements that are being put in place around care homes. There will be a full public inquiry into all aspects of this. Care homes will be absolutely central uh, to that and we will continue uh, to take steps to, to learn as we go. Uh, but it is important that we don't lose focus on continuing to take the right decisions or the best decisions we can uh, as we, we go forward. I know there is a, a sense and uh, a, a real desire on everybody's part to think that we are through this. We are not through this. We are about to go into winter and we must remain focused on doing all of the things that are required to keep the country as safe as possible. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. And I kind of thank the First Minister for the answer. And it's precisely because we are going into winter that we need transparency over the lessons that we need to learn from that first wave and the, that awful toll of deaths which took place in Scotland's care homes. Let me move back to yesterday's announcement uh, again. And as I said, Scottish Labour has long called for a national care service. So it is welcome to see the First Minister come round to our way of thinking. It's not before time, but committing to a review of social care is very different from committing to wholesale reform. And my concern is that the First Minister doesn't seem to know what a national care service should look like. She shouldn't need an independent review to tell her the basic principles it should be built on. We know that three quarters of Scotland's care homes are currently run by private providers, which have higher rates of staff vacancies and higher rates of staff turnover. HC1, the largest provider, receives substantial amounts of public money but is owned by holding companies registered in offshore tax havens like the Channel Islands and the Cayman Islands. We believe that a national care service must remove the profit motive from the delivery of care. 
This is not a technical matter. It is a political question. It is a moral question. Why can't the First Minister bring herself to agree? First Minister. Um, I, I do actually agree, and I think I've done so before. Before I come on to that point, um, can I just complete the point about transparency around care homes? Because I actually agree with that too, um, and that's why we're taking certain steps that we are taking. It's why, for example, uh, we have asked Public Health Scotland by the end of this month to produce validated statistics on patients tested uh, prior to discharge into care homes and the outcome and the date of that test so that we know exactly what happened there and are able to ensure that the appropriate and proper lessons are learned. So while we focus on uh, the decisions that lie ahead of us, we are learning as we go and making sure that, uh, unlike any other part of the UK so far, there is those uh, validated reports uh, that allow Parliament to properly scrutinise that. And I, I think that is important. On uh, the issue of a national care service, I, I do agree, and I agree with the, the principles that Richard Leonard has enunciated, but there is a difference here, and I, I, I simply say this as a, a statement of fact, not intended as a, a pejorative or a, a, a political point, but there is a difference between calling for something in opposition and delivering it in government. You, you have to work out, not just uh, the vision that you are seeking to achieve, but the detail of how you get from here to there. And that is why it is really important that we do that properly, we do that systemically, uh, and we understand all of the practical issues. Issues around uh, the employment of staff, about structural integration, issues um, around the, the consistency of standards, um, issues uh, around funding and, and charging uh, for care home and how that has to be funded. So it is my job, the Scottish Government's job, not just to uh, see what we want to happen, but actually put in place the plans that can deliver it. And that's the work, uh, the serious work that we are committed to undertaking, helped, uh, of course, by the independent review that the Health Secretary announced yesterday. That's the responsibility of government. It's a responsibility I take seriously each and every day, and it's a responsibility that I will be judged on, as I said to Ruth Davidson at the election in just a few months' time. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, the, uh, the concern is that experience tells us that when the SNP government resort to reviews, it often means kicking things into the long grass. But there are steps that could be taken now which would show that the government is serious about improving social care. So, First Minister, will you give a commitment today to appoint trade union representatives and representatives of care users to the review panel announced yesterday? so that the voices of those who deliver care and those who receive it is at the centre of that review. Secondly, will you establish collective bargaining in the care sector, as recommended by our own Fair Work Commission? And finally, will you act to ensure that the extraordinary staff who deliver social care are given the status they deserve, the security at work that they need, and the pay and conditions that they have long merited. First Minister. On the issue of the composition of the independent review, I, look, I, we will listen to suggestions and if, if there is a feeling that we want to add people to that, we will consider that. Um, trade unions and the voice of trade unions are vital to everything we do. Uh, and I think uh, most people looking at how we do our business would, would see that as being absolutely the case. Uh, the voice of care users, Ian Welsh, who uh, in the, the dark distant past was a, a Labour MSP uh, from the Alliance, uh, is on the review representing uh, care users. Malcolm Chisholm, a former Labour uh, Health Minister is uh, a member of, of the review. So we have uh, cast that net widely to get people not just of experience of the issues we're dealing with here, but experience across the political spectrum. And, and I hope that is something that is welcomed. Uh, on the issues, and, and Richard Leonard has, has absolutely illustrated the point I'm making uh, about the difference between calling for something in opposition and delivering it in government. So, you know, he says, can you make sure that the dedicated people who work in uh, the care sector, and they are dedicated people who have my eternal gratitude, uh, particularly after the last few months, uh, that they have the pay and conditions and the status. There is a practical problem with me giving that guarantee right now, is we don't employ directly a single uh, one of them. So we have to look at how we reform the system to allow all of that to be delivered. It's not enough for me as First Minister just to wish something into reality. I've got to take the steps that bring it into reality and that's what I am committed to doing. Uh, and we want to move on this quickly, which is why 
Uh, we have asked the Independent Review to give us a report by January. I'm not sure whether Richard Leonard will still be standing in his place by then. We will wait and see. But by January, uh, we will have the first, the first report of that Independent Review that allows us to take uh, actions in the short term, but also uh, continue the work in the longer term. This is, I think, a big opportunity for all of us. And I, I give Richard Leonard actually a lot of credit for arguing the case for this. Uh, but let's pull together and make sure that we actually seize this opportunity to turn it into reality. But we don't, any of us, do a service to that goal if we simply try to gloss over the real complexities about, about this. It's really important that we get it right, and I hope Richard Leonard will engage with the independent review um, in the constructive way that I, I'm, I'm sure he intends to do. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Greens have consistently supported a precautionary approach with the aim of eliminating coronavirus. So while we all regret the need for extra measures being introduced in Glasgow, Western Bartonshire and East Renfrewshire, we know this is necessary. We know this is necessary if we're going to stop local outbreaks as rapidly as we can. But the First Minister has recognised that many people find it hard to see why rules applying to homes don't apply to other places where more people from more households are mixing. And communicating this will be a bigger challenge as new students arrive in Glasgow in the coming weeks for the start of term. Included in that will be a substantial number of international students. How will the Scottish Government support clear communication at local level about these measures? What steps will be taken to ensure that young people arriving in Glasgow understand the new restrictions? And can the First Minister tell us what role testing will play in ensuring that the start of term won't increase the risk to communities or to university staff? First Minister. Um, many of these questions are addressed and indeed answered, as uh, I know Patrick Harvey will be aware, in the updated guidance for higher and further education that was published uh, yesterday by the Deputy First Minister. Um, and in terms of international students, uh, the, the, the key uh, and most effective measure is to ensure that quarantine uh, responsibilities and obligations are being adhered to. Um, and we, in that guidance, have made very clear our expectations of uh, education institutions, uh, that they will ensure that their students understand that and comply uh, with those uh, restrictions. Um, in terms of uh, the making sure international students who will be coming from countries where the public health uh, advice may not be exactly the same as it is here, that's also a core part of uh, the guidance to make sure that uh, universities and colleges are doing everything that they need to do, uh, whether that's an induction uh, packs or ongoing information for students, uh, so that they know uh, the advice that is in place here in Scotland and that they are complying with that. Testing is uh, the area, as on a whole range of uh, issues, that we continue uh, to keep under review and take uh, ongoing clinical advice on. Uh, the balance of judgment that we have reached around students coming from uh, countries uh, that are deemed to be highest risk is that uh, quarantine is the effective measure. And if uh, testing is seen to be an alternative to that, that actually could inadvertently increase the risk. If a, a student uh, arriving gets a negative test and then doesn't quarantine, uh, but they may test positive later in the incubation period, that increases the risk. So quarantine is what we have uh, said is the, the most important measure there. More widely, uh, we want to make sure that any student, like any member of the population, who has symptoms of COVID is going quickly uh, for testing and has good access to testing. So as I've said before, uh, the new walk-in centres for testing that we will be establishing over the next few weeks, uh, a key and principal priority for the location of those is where there are student populations. And indeed, it's no accident and no coincidence that the first of these is uh, located in St Andrews. Uh, so we will continue to take uh, an overview of all of these things. Um, and I am uh, confident that the university sector understands the importance of its responsibilities and will take the steps uh, that it needs to take to keep its own students safe but ensure that their student population are not posing risks to the rest of the country. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I appreciate what was a very detailed answer there but uh, and I think we all understand that there are complexities around using testing uh, as effectively as we need to but the First Minister will also know that there are university staff who shared some of the same concerns that were had by school staff ahead of schools reopening uh, and they want to have clarity about how these issues 
will be addressed. We also, presiding officer, need to be uh, especially aware of the impact lockdown has had and that the new restrictions will have on our most vulnerable citizens. We need unity and collective spirit across society if we're going to recover from this crisis and that can't be achieved when vital support services uh, are being lost. In Glasgow, citizens advice bureaus, uh, Glasgow and Clyde Rape Crisis, Glasgow Women's Aid, the Lodging House Mission and Drum Chapel Money Advice Centre, among others, uh, have all been placed under threat. In just the last hour, they've been given a short-term lifeline, but they still face long-term uncertainty. Does the First Minister accept that these are essential services, that they already struggle to meet demand, and that this demand is only likely to grow uh, over the coming months? And does she agree that the Scottish Government must share with councils the responsibility to ensure that these vital services in Glasgow and elsewhere are saved for the long term? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree. Um, not only do I think that these services are, are essential services, I, I used to work uh, as a lawyer in Drumchapel Law and Money Advice Centre, um, Govan Law Centre is in my constituency, Castle Milk Law Centre um, ha has services in uh, parts of my constituency. I see each and every day the importance of these services, and I think Patrick Harvey is right. The demand for and reliance on these services is, if anything, only going to grow. Um, it, it's certainly not uh, likely to decline. I very much welcome uh, Glasgow City Council's announcement this morning of a, a £4 million uh, transition fund, which uh, does give uh, welcome relief to uh, some of these uh, services uh, that were concerned um, about proposals over the past few days. Um, and it does give an opportunity for uh, Glasgow City Council to work with them and indeed uh, for the government to work with local authorities to consider the best uh, arrangements for the long term support. I, I think the announcement this morning is not only welcome in a very practical sense, but also demonstrates that Glasgow City Council and the administration there uh, is very much listening uh, and attuned uh, to these concerns. Um, so all of us want to see these services protected. Uh, all of us are fully understanding it. I know Patrick Harvey in particular understands the constraints on uh, the Scottish Government's uh, budget and uh, therefore by extension the constraints on local authority budgets but there is a really strong sense of the importance of these services um, and I certainly want to see them continue and go from strength to strength. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, I share the First Minister's concern about the recent outbreaks too. Infection rates in the west of Scotland are now higher than most of England and countries like Greece and Portugal, for which we have just imposed quarantine measures. I'm worried that we don't seem to be on top of this. First, we locked down Aberdeen with citywide measures. Now we are restricting a whole region of almost a million people. So I wonder what we are not getting right. Test and Protect was supposed to drive the virus out before it spread. Why has this not happened in Aberdeen or Glasgow? Is it really up to the job? First Minister. Uh, yes, it is. And I, I would encourage Willie Rennie to perhaps learn a little bit more about how Test and Protect operates um, and also to understand, not just in Scotland, uh, not just across the UK, but in every country, the importance of, of these systems. And I actually think Scotland has probably got one of the best uh, systems uh, anywhere because it is built from the bottom up on our well-established health protection uh, workforce um, and the way it does that uh, is, is not new and we've scaled it up significantly. Uh, test and protect, if, if we hadn't test and protect then uh, we would not have been able to contain the outbreak in Aberdeen uh, and if we hadn't test and protect we would not have been able to contain as effectively as it was the case the outbreak in the Two Sisters food processing plant in Cooper Angus. Uh, it is because of test and protect that these outbreaks have not seeded uh, wide, uh, wider and more widespread community transmission. Test and protect, and you know, I've, I've said this right from the start, and I'm not the only one who, who says these things, it is not the first line of defence, and it cannot do all of this on its own. Um, so test and protect is there when an outbreak starts to make sure it doesn't spread more widely, um, and is also there to give us crucial intelligence and data to know where to target additional uh, actions. And that's uh, why we've taken certain actions in Glasgow that we didn't take in Aberdeen because the nature of the, the problem we're dealing with right now is not identical. But the first line of defence is all of us. And, and Scotland is not 
Uh, it's not just that we're not unique here. We're in no way uh, out of sync with what's happening right across Europe, where transmission is, is rising. Uh, actually, in terms of our overall uh, positivity rate, the numbers I've uh, announced again today, positivity rate of around 1%, which is actually lower than you will find in uh, many other countries right now, well below the 5% threshold that the WHO says is the sign of a, an outbreak being under control. But all of us have to play our part in keeping this under control. And uh, when we don't stick to the rules, uh, then we will see uh, outbreaks and clusters happen and then test and protect the job is to try to contain them. It's doing that job very well. And I, I, I target this last sentence to all of us, myself included. I think all of us have got to do our jobs maybe just a bit better because we're all perhaps thinking it's over and, and not being as stringent. And I think it's a moment for all of us just to tighten up on how we are abiding by all of these really important rules. Willie Rennie. I'm sorry if the First Minister doesn't like me asking these questions, but it's important that opposition members challenge the government on its performance. And I am deeply worried we're not on top of the virus. If we're having to restrict the activities of almost a million people, I have a duty to ask what the government is doing. And I think the First Minister should accept that that is the case. It was reported that some of the infections may come from holidaymakers returning home with the virus. Last week, I asked the Justice Secretary why the quarantine spot checks had lost almost 700 people. He didn't know the answer. So can the First Minister tell me, do we have this outbreak in the west of Scotland because those quarantine spot checks didn't work? And if not, why do we have the outbreak? First Minister. Um, I, I don't mind anybody asking me questions. I've probably answered more questions. <laughs> I've probably answered more questions on uh, COVID over the past uh, than any other leader anywhere, perhaps, in the world. Um, I have no objection to that. I just think there is a duty on all of us, not just government, but opposition as well, to really make sure we understand how all of these things are working so that we are giving the proper advice uh, to the people across Scotland. And, you know, if we look across the UK right now, the kind of restrictions that are now in place in the west of Scotland have been in place for some weeks in the northwest of uh, England. Uh, they, are, they have been in place in, in places like Manchester. You look across Europe right now, uh, and there are many parts of Europe with even more stringent restrictions. It's actually because, and this is absolutely counterintuitive, it's because we're on top of this that we're acting preventatively and in an early intervention way to try to stop these outbreaks really running out of control. And it's test and protect that's giving us the information and the data to allow us to target this as effectively um, as we, we can. On quarantine, uh, we have uh, put in place, uh, and, and these are arrangements that are in place across the UK, um, regulations for countries where we think there is a particular risk. Greece, we know from test and protect that a number of cases have come in from Greece, which is why we've actually acted earlier than other parts of the UK to place that country on the quarantine risk. Public Health Scotland then does the job it uh, has been tasked to do to make sure it is doing sample checks to ensure compliance. So these uh, systems are working. We will always keep the operation and the efficacy of them under control. But I come back to a fundamental point here that it is down to every single one of us to be abiding by all of these rules. And that is, applies whether you're coming back from a country overseas, it applies whether you're having people in your house, it applies when you're out and about and making sure you're following all of the rules. Uh, government uh, has got the lead responsibility here, but government can't do this on its own. All of us have to do the right things. And the good news is, if we all do the right things, then we can keep uh, this virus under control. And while the numbers we are seeing right now, uh, in common with many countries, are causing concern again, uh, I come back to this point that we are still at a positivity rate, given the uh, vastly increased numbers of tests that we are doing, of around 1%. And that should allow us to be vigilant, uh, not to be complacent, but also to keep it in perspective. Thank you. Question number five, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the approach of colder weather, reports of an increase in the COVID-19 transmission rate, and concerns regarding some people not wearing face coverings in shops and public transport, how many fines have been issued for failing to comply with the face covering rules since they became mandatory and enforceable by the police? First Minister. Uh, the enforcement of the coronavirus regulations is a matter for the Chief Constable in Police Scotland. 
Um, and Police Scotland have indicated uh, that to date the vast majority of people are, as we would expect, complying with the regulations. Uh, in the approach Police Scotland has taken, enforcement has always been a last resort. Uh, engagement, explanation and encouragement to comply uh, are uh, the first priorities and enforcement is taken where these fail. Uh, the latest data available on Police Scotland's uh, own website shows that 20 fixed penalty notices were issued between the 10th of July and 25th August, uh, when, and that's the period when face covering regulations came into force. The published figures don't uh, break uh, those down into the reasons that the fixed penalty notices were issued. Uh, this is, of course, Police Scotland uh, data and the presentation and format of that is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. Christine Graham. And I thank the First Minister for her answer, and I would emphasise I'm not blaming the police, but with COVID creep all too evident, bus drivers, store managers, shop assistants and the public often feel helpless and exasperated by the flouting of the use of face coverings by a growing minority, in my view. So is the Scottish Government considering upping the ante by requiring individuals to provide, if asked, albeit discreetly, evidence of their exemptions, I'm not suggesting GP notes by any means, together with stiffer fines, both of which would deter non-compliance, assist the police and provide that added protection for the travelling and shopping public and release shop managers, shop assistants and bus drivers from the pressure that sometimes put upon them to do something. First Minister. I think uh, the police have got to continue to act with discretion as, as they have been uh, doing in response to Christine Graham's question about uh, amending the enforcement regime. Uh, in a general sense, we will keep that under review. We have uh, changed the uh, areas of enforcement on previous occasions and we will always uh, consider doing that if we, we think that is, is necessary and you know, levels of fixed penalty fines uh, for non-compliance will be something we consider. I think in terms of face coverings, people who have uh, health reasons for not wearing a face covering, we have to continue to act uh, sensitively to that and I know Christine Graham does agree uh, with that. Fundamentally here, we can and, and we will have enforcement regimes in place, but, but all of us have a duty here to do the right things for the right reasons, not simply because the law says we have to do it. I think all of us, and I, I include myself in this, uh, given that we've been living with this for six months now, it gets harder. Um, these things are all a, a real pain uh, to, to have to comply with. And perhaps we, uh, some of us uh, at times, uh, just uh, don't take as much care. I think we've all got to remind ourselves of why these things are being advised um, and make sure that we comply at all stages. I think on face coverings, I think the vast, vast majority of people are complying, but anybody who is not and they don't have a good reason uh, for, for not doing so, then I would urge them to really think about it because wearing a face covering is protecting other people um, and other people wearing a face covering is protecting you. It is one of the best expressions of that collective solidarity that will get us through uh, this crisis. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that police call-outs for people experiencing severe mental distress have increased by up to 25% during lockdown. First Minister. Police Scotland officers are very often the first to respond to urgent situations involving people with mental health issues and as such have an important role in providing support as part of a multi-agency approach uh, that includes their role in the Distress Brief Intervention uh, Programme, uh, which takes referrals from emergency responders, including the police. To support individuals in distress during the COVID pandemic, the government has provided over a million pounds uh, to expand the DBI programme nationally. We've also provided an additional £2.1 million to enable the NHS 24 Mental Health Hub to expand to a 24-7 service, um, as well as providing immediate help and advice. The hub can now refer individuals in emotional distress, but who don't need emergency clinical intervention, to the dis Distress Brief Intervention programme for further support. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? But First Minister, the third sector, uh, our, our main interface with the most vulnerable in our society, especially during the current crisis. But they are telling me they are struggling with a severe lack of resource. There's reports of a rising suicide rate. There's a rising death rate in those suffering with addiction, up to a third during lockdown, as well as a rising issue with adult and child poor mental health. It is little wonder that our frontline police are having to pick up the pieces. I think the concern here is, and I understand this, there is a fixation on the effects of COVID-19 to the detriment of those in our society who mostly go unseen. So I ask the First Minister if our government will look again with urgency at the support being offered to our third sector 
And does she recognise that this crisis should give us the opportunity to look again at how we fund our third sector? First Minister. Um, I will always uh, keep under review how we're funding the third sector, particularly during this crisis. And, and yes, I do think, as on so many other issues, we have an opportunity to look at, to see how uh, we do things generally and whether we can make uh, more fundamental improvements there. I will make the point again, because it's a point that for me and the government is inescapable, that our, our budget is largely finite and uh, we cannot, you know, we, we stretch that as far as we can, but there are limits uh, to that. In terms of funding, uh, specifically in relation to mental health, um, it is really important that we give people places to go for help and support. Um, that doesn't involve them going to emergency services or allows them to be referred when they do contact emergency services, which is why the DBI programme is so important. It is why uh, the scaling up of the NHS 24 service is so important as well. Um, and you know, I, if we look in terms of investment, additional investment during this crisis in support of uh, children and uh, young people in particular, and this is relevant, of course, to the third sector, uh, we have invested uh, for a helpline to be delivered by the Spark Counselling Service. We've uh, given extra funding to Young Scott uh, to develop enhanced uh, digital contact, uh, content for young people. Uh, we've given funding to uh, the National Autistic Society to give more help to people uh, with autism. Uh, so there are a range of ways in which we have supported third sector organisations. Um, and I agree with the member, we have a duty to make sure we continue to look carefully at that uh, to ensure that where further support is required, uh, if possible, we are able to provide it. Question number seven, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that the Test and Protect system is functioning effectively. First Minister. Uh, test and Protect is uh, working well and it is doing uh, what we need it to do, identifying positive cases early, tracing contacts uh, so that they get the right public health advice and, of course, providing us with the detailed data to guide our response more broadly. Uh, fluctuations in demand for testing uh, have always been uh, likely and indeed uh, probable. Uh, following the increase in demand for testing we saw after schools went back, uh, we brought additional contingency capacity online, including additional mobile testing uh, units. Uh, and of course, work is ongoing to even further increase laboratory capacity in Scotland. Uh, and we will continue to make sure that both the uh, capacity to take tests from people and the capacity to process those tests uh, increases and it uh, has contingencies built in uh, to that. In addition, as I said yesterday, we will very soon launch the proximity tracing app Protect Scotland which will help to complement the proven and well-established person-to-person contact tracing that is uh, what Test and Protect is based on. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? Care workers in my constituency and across Scotland are reporting delays in receiving the results from COVID-19 tests. In some cases, the delays are for five to six days, which means that staff don't know whether it's safe for them to be at their work. First Minister knows that pressure on testing will build over the winter, so there is a need to increase capacity, particularly when there is the risk of increased transmission and local restrictions in areas such as mine in Western Bartonshire. Can the First Minister advise when capacity will be increased, when will the 22 local testing centres be rolled out, and can I welcome, Presiding Officer, the sighting of the Mobile Army Testing Unit in Western Bartonshire because of the new restrictions in the area, but can the First Minister commit to providing permanent local testing facilities so that my constituents are not having to travel huge distances to places like Danoon or Edinburgh to get tested. First person. Um, the mobile capacity is important uh, because of its mobile nature, because it does allow, you know, even in at Jackie Bailey's constituency, it allows us to take capacity to particular areas that are much closer to people. So I think it's really important that we have uh, fixed capacity, which we will have in strategic locations around the country, but actually that we keep that mobile capacity to be more flexible in terms of the response. And of course, the Army mobile testing units, and you know, I expressed yesterday and do so again today, my gratitude to the Army, are now being uh, run by the Scottish Ambulance Service. Um, in terms of the, the turnaround time for testing, we have 
Uh, a, a very short turnaround time. Over the past two weeks, there have been pressures on that because of the increase in demand in Scotland, but also across the UK. Uh, we work very closely with the UK government. If you take care, the care home portal and the provision of tests there, and then the throughput through the Lighthouse Laboratory, that is UK government uh, administered, but we work constructively to make sure that Scotland's uh, capacity within that is being uh, properly safeguarded. Uh, and in addition to that, we are uh, building NHS laboratory capacity um, and also looking at ways in which we can uh, use NHS resources uh, to do tests uh, in order to make sure that the capacity through the UK-wide system is, is going where it is most needed. Um, testing demand and, and the delivery of tests will always, given the nature of what we're dealing with, fluctuate to some extent. Um, but if I take the, the figures uh, for the 26th of August, which are a few days old because uh, it allows us to give the most up-to-date comparison with other parts of the UK. For the so-called Pillar 2 testing, uh, on the 26th of August, there was uh, proportionately uh, more than double the amount of testing done in Scotland than in England. Now, that will partly be because of our schools going back. Um, so we need to make sure that uh, there is an inbuilt uh, flexibility and contingency to this, um, and that's what we are committed to doing. Thank you. We move to open supplementaries. Bob Doris to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we have heard already this afternoon, the recent spike in cases in Glasgow, Western Bartonshire and East Renfrewshire has seen measures put in place to reduce the risk of the rapid rise of COVID-19 cases. Clarity of message is very important, and there are two themes that have been raised with me over the last uh, 12 hours or so when this has been known. Uh, so can the First Minister confirm whether tradespeople can continue to operate in people's houses and whether informal childcare, such as a grand looking after the grandchild after school can continue to take place? First Minister. Um, these are the important practical questions people always have in these situations. Uh, there is a, a, a detailed Q&A on the Scottish Government's website which uh, addresses both of these points. Yes, you can still have uh, tradesmen going into your house to carry out uh, you know, essential repairs uh, or installations uh, or deliveries, but we are saying you should take particular care around all of the rules on uh, hygiene uh, and the correct wearing of face coverings uh, while any of that is happening. Formal and informal childcare arrangements can also continue, but again, extra care should be taken uh, with informal childcare arrangements, uh, which is involving someone from another household entering your home or a child entering your home. Uh, what we try to do is be as proportionate um, and minimise the restrictions as much as possible, but make sure that in the, on the basis of the clinical advice, they are as effectively targeted as possible to get to the heart of where we think the risk from, uh, of transmission is coming from. And that's what we've tried to do in the west of Scotland. Liz Smith, before by Anna Sawa. Uh, may I ask the First Minister to tell us what discussions are taking place between the Scottish Government and SQA about the timing of the 2021 exam diet? First Minister. Uh, we continue to discuss uh, these things on an ongoing basis. We're not uh, the only government across the UK that is having to uh, deal with these issues. I very much hope that we can see normality return uh, to uh, the education system generally and to our exam system uh, next year, but we are in a highly uncertain situation and it's important that we respond to that. We also, of course, will want to take account of uh, the review into the situation this year that has been commissioned um, and continue to ensure that that informs any decisions we take. And I ask that word to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, President Officer. There has been a lot of pain, hurt and anger in Glasgow over the last week about the proposal to cut or, in some cases, completely withdraw funding from lifeline, last resort and crisis services like citizens' advice bureaus, uh, law centres, Glasgow Women's Aid and Glasgow and Clyde rape crisis. I welcome the £4 million resilience fund that has been announced today, but it shouldn't have to have taken a campaign in the city over the last week from people who are already distressed by this virus in order to save those vital services. First Minister, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Thousands of our citizens have lost their lives. Hundreds of thousands of them risk losing their jobs. Our economy has collapsed and our services aren't coping. How did anyone think cutting these services now was the answer? So as a fellow Glasgow MSP and someone I know cares passionately about these issues, Will you condemn that proposal and decision from Glasgow City Council? And as First Minister, will you ensure that these services are adequately funded now and into the long term? Because we collectively should be fighting 
to strengthen these support services, not decimating them? First Minister. Um, I've got a huge amount of sympathy for the, the sentiment uh, behind that question. As Anas Sarwar uh, will know, because uh, as a Glasgow MSP, I'm sure he spent a lot of time uh, you know, looking into this issue very closely, as I have in the, the last week uh, from my constituency interest. Uh, a set of proposals, the uh, fund that uh, was uh, being allocated was massively oversubscribed, uh, as will be the case for governments and councils in any of these decisions, tough decisions have to be made. A set of proposals uh, have been put forward that, as I understand it, don't go for political consideration by the council until uh, tomorrow. Uh, the council, I think, rightly has uh, responded to understandable concerns about the impact of the proposals on the advice sector. And uh, Jennifer Layden, uh, the, the councillor uh, responsible in the administration, has made a very, very welcome announcement today. These are difficult times. Uh, I'm afraid I, I cannot because uh, our, as I keep saying, our budget is largely finite uh, and therefore difficult decisions, I'm afraid, while we uh, still have uh, these decisions uh, effectively governed by uh, decisions that have been taken elsewhere, cannot be escaped. But I think actually the decision uh, and the announcement from Glasgow City Council this morning is a recognition of the importance of these services and I think a very welcome uh, signal that Glasgow City Council is listening carefully uh, and trying to make the right decisions given the uh, current situation that we are all facing. Claire Adamson to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, my office received a concerning um, report from a constituent who had attended a scheduled COVID-19 test at Regional Sports Centre in Ravenscraig. Um, they arrived to find this the site closed, indeed the gates were padlocks with no signage and no information to those affected. Can I ask the First Minister if she was aware of this problem and ask what improvements can we expect now that the Scottish Ambulance Service is assuming responsibility for these test sites such as Ravens Creek in my constituency? First Minister. Well, I think the mobile testing system has been working well. I think having that now uh, run by the Scottish Ambulance Service does give us greater flexibility and allows us to make sure that we're building the, the required resilience into that. I have not been uh, aware of particular issues at, at Ravenscraig. Uh, obviously, the issue Claire Adamson uh, has raised today, I'd be very happy, in fact, keen to look into and understand further so if she can uh, write with a bit more detail of uh, the, the situation that she's described. I or the Health Secretary will look into that and get back to you as soon as possible. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, prior to COVID-19, Scotland was losing the battle against obesity, with two in three people being overweight or obese. Clearly, the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated an already serious problem, with directors of public health calling for action to tackle issues like poor diet and lack of exercise. Therefore, what measures will the government put in place to ensure that adequate support and help is afforded to those who need it most. First Minister. Uh, obesity and healthy weight is a, a serious issue for all of us to uh, make sure we, we do everything we can to address. Um, I would commend yesterday's programme for government to the member. Uh, reading that, he will see a range of different things that the government is going to uh, take forward to try to do that. One of the things I think from memory I specifically mentioned um, in setting out the programme for government, of course, was the uh, £500 million investment in active travel over the next few years to encourage people to uh, have active ways of getting around that help uh, give them the exercise that is a key part of tackling obesity and unhealthy weight. Obviously, we had to uh, put on hold legislation around uh, unhealthy uh, promotions. Uh, we want to get that back on track as quickly as possible. Um, and in a whole range of different ways, uh, we are seeking to support health health boards and uh, local organisations uh, promote the kind of behaviour that we want uh, others to take up um, and allow all of us to get on top of what is a big issue and, and an issue that we've always known uh, but given uh, some of the experience of Covid uh, we have been reminded of how important it is to people's overall health. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the calls being made by the SQA Where's Our Say campaign group. Far from being resolved, they raise the issues from a significant number of young people who still feel that their grades are not fair. This group is making two calls. Firstly, that individuals, not schools, be able to submit appeals where there is evidence of performance that was not part of the teacher assessment, and that individuals be permitted to submit an appeal where estimated grades were lower than those submitted via UCAS. Earlier in this session, the First Minister claimed 
that she takes responsibility for the mistakes made with exam grades, but it's two days until university places will be fixed. So will she make good on that claim? And will she give young people the direct right of appeal that they were promised? Um, the SQA have put forward options on appeals in the context of the position we reached on teacher judgments uh, for this year's uh, results um, and uh, you know, I'll, the Education Secretary will be happy to write to Daniel Johnson with more detail of uh, exactly the, the reasons uh, that they came to that uh, decision. I know this has been a difficult uh, period for all uh, young people but in terms of university places of course we have already given a commitment that we will fund more university places uh, so that young people don't lose out as a result of the issues that have been encountered uh, this year. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Hunters and B in my constituency will cease energy production in early 2022. Whilst defuelling will mean no immediate job losses, investment locally in green, green clean energy is now the priority, not least through delivery of commitments made through the Ayrshire Growth Deal. Realisation of plans to redevelop the neighbouring Hunterson Park with its deep water port to include logistics energy research is vital and must be progressed if we are to sustain and then grow North Ayrshire's economy. Will the Scottish Government work in partnership with the UK Government and North Ayrshire Council to deliver the economic transition of the area as part of its Green New Deal? Um, yes, we absolutely will. Um, obviously, the decommissioning of Hunterston uh, raises challenges, but it also raises opportunities, both in terms of uh, our energy mix, but uh, also in terms of community and economic regeneration. And it's important that we do work collaboratively to make sure that we, we seize those opportunities. Uh, there is a, a real relevance here uh, of the, the whole just transition approach. Uh, obviously, as Kenny Gibson has mentioned, the Ayrshire Growth Deal has a key part to play here, but we look forward to working with all partners to make sure that this is done properly and in a way that has employment and the interests of local communities very much at heart. Liam Kerr, followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday's programme for government mentioned the hate crime bill, but failed to mention its costs. Submissions by the police suggest that the costs of the bill have been grossly underestimated and that several policing costs have not even been accounted for. Does the First Minister recognise the police's concerns? And given the many other concerns already highlighted around this bill, will she now consider rethinking the bill? First Minister. Um, for, for, forgive me if I'm, uh, if I'm misremembering who asked this question. Yes, I think it was Liam Kerr and I, I, I answered, so I'm probably just going to repeat the answer I gave yesterday. We are at the start of the legislative process. I know concerns have been raised about this bill. I've given a commitment. We are listening carefully, and if we uh, require to make amendments, we will do that. And as part of the legislative process, of course, issues around uh, the financial implications of, of the bill will be fully considered and, and taken account of. That's the right and proper way to do things. Um, in a parliament. Um, I do, and I make no apology for this, think it is really important that as a society we do more to tackle hate crime uh, because the, the pernicious impact uh, on often already disadvantaged groups of hate crime is unacceptable and none of us should be prepared to tolerate uh, or live with that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression is absolutely fundamental and as legislators it is our responsibility to strike the right balance. And these things are not easy, but it is why we are elected to come to this place to do that difficult work. And that's what the legislative process is for. And I would encourage the member to engage with it in detail, as I'm sure he will, uh, rather than uh, simply engage in kind of headlines uh, across uh, the chamber. Let's get down to the detail of doing the hard work to get to the right outcome that I think most people across the country want to see. Neil Findlay, to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, the new Scottish Met Service has been established with a budget of £37,000 per patient. This is almost double what it would cost if women to, were to make the choice to travel to the US for removal surgery ca carried out by pioneering surgeon Dr Veronicus. Women in Scotland will not return for removal surgery to those doctors who recommended they receive Im the implants in the first place. That trust is broken and they do not believe that those doctors have the knowledge or training to carry out full, safe mesh removals. So will the First Minister agree in the interests of patient safety, well-being, and indeed value for money, that if the women choose, they will be able to be treated by Dr Veronicus with the NHS covering the cost of their visit for this specialist procedure? First Minister. Um, can I make uh, two or three quick points in, in response to that. I, I absolutely hear, and I've, uh, as Neil Finlay knows, uh, spoken directly to many of the women affected uh, by mesh implants. So I, 
absolutely understand the trust breakdown issue. Um, what I would say, and I don't say this glibly um, or underestimate how difficult it is, but I also think there's a responsibility on the part of government to try to rebuild that trust. And that's part of the, uh, the, the impetus of the work we are trying to do. And I, and I think it is right that we seek to do that uh, working with women. Uh, we will, yes, consider options uh, for any woman in, in terms of the best option for them. Uh, what I would say in terms of supporting women to go to other countries, we also have to consider uh, not just procedures, but after care and make sure that there is an integrated approach to the care uh, of women, which has perhaps been one of the things that hasn't been sufficiently prioritised in the past. Uh, and thirdly, and I'm not going to get into uh, great detail here, um, but those who are close to this uh, issue uh, know probably more than uh, most members do, we have worked very hard to try to get uh, good arrangements with Dr Veronicus. For one reason and another, they haven't come to pass in the way that we thought uh, they might do. But we continue to be open-minded. We have continued to try to persuade um, and facilitate, rather is probably a better word than persuade, facilitate Dr Veronicus coming uh, to Scotland in a, a proper way that allows proper care uh, for, for, for women. So we will continue to try to do the right things in uh, a whole range of ways and consider uh, any outcome that any woman uh, asks uh, us to consider. And uh, the Health Secretary will continue to give this issue uh, the utmost priority. Alistair Allen to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Yesterday, opposition parties claimed that the extension of childcare to 1140 hours was not being delivered. Can the First Minister tell us, despite the impact of COVID, how many of Scotland's 32 local authorities are delivering 1140 hours? First Minister. Uh, 11 councils are currently delivering uh, 1140 hours in full. Angus, Argyll and Butte, Clackmannish, Dumfries and Galloway, Dundee, East Renfrewshire, Inverclyde, Scottish Borders, Shetland, South Ayrshire and Stirling. 18 councils are delivering 1140 hours in uh, some or most nurseries and some of them are substantially delivering it. Perth and Kinross, for example, 84% uh, of nurseries are, nurseries are delivering it in full. In Renfrewshire, 80%. In Edinburgh, 85%. Right now, there's only three councils in the whole country who are not delivering any 1140 hours provision, although to be fair to them, they, are all, they all have plans in place to progress it. But the three councils not delivering any right now Labour-led North Lanarkshire, Labour-led West Lothian and Tory-led Aberdeenshire. And I hope to see progress in these three councils uh, as we deliver this flagship commitment in full. Andy Whiteman, to be followed by Lee McCarthy. Uh, yesterday, the First Minister expressed her gratitude to the emergency services for the work they've done during the COVID crisis, and I join her in that gratitude. She'll be aware of the PAY student paramedics campaign. Uh, will she agree to establish a bursary scheme for student paramedics? similar to that currently available to student nurses? First Minister. Uh, firstly, can I say uh, I am aware of the campaign. I've had constituents of my own uh, contact me about it. We, uh, I'm not going to uh, cover all the detail in the interest of time, but we provide support for student paramedics in a, a range of different ways. However, the call that has been made for a bursary is one we intend to look at. We are about to do a review uh, of uh, arrangements for allied health professionals generally, and we will include this issue in that uh, review. And I'm sure uh, members across the chamber, as well as student par paramedics, will make a strong case uh, for the arrangements that they think are appropriate. And Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that uh, shielding requirements ahead of medical operations uh, preclude use of public transport. She'll also be aware that patients from Orkney and Shetland needing specialist treatment in hospitals on the Scottish mainland have to take a ferry or plane to get there. At present, therefore, the two-week quarantine period prior to an operation effectively prevents IELTS patients from getting the treatment they need. I understand that revised guidance has been developed that would greatly reduce the quarantine period uh, in line with what's in place elsewhere in the UK. So will the First Minister now ensure this guidance is implemented as a matter of urgency so that patients in my constituency have the same access to treatment as those in other parts of Scotland? First Minister. Um, yeah, I am aware of this issue and I know it has had uh, the attention of the Health Secretary. We are uh, finalising uh, the guidance that, that will be put in place to make sure that there are appropriate arrangements in place but that don't uh, make it more difficult for uh, patients on the islands to get the treatment that they uh, need. I'll ask the Health Secretary to uh, correspond with the member just uh, about the, the timescale for that and the detail of that guidance which we would hope would be published uh, fairly soon um, but we'll keep the member updated. Thank you very much and I'm afraid apologies to members we have to conclude FMQs at that point.
Parliament will resume at 2.30 with a statement on the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, and I suspend this meeting. Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can okay it unless it goes through London. Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello, and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. It is now and forever will be known as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe in 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance stone. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic, down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European. And that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets.